In this section of the book, we define one of the most important functions in all of calculus, the exponential function. It's not easy to define, and there are lots of different ways. It's done differently in different books. If you look in another source, they might define it a different way, but we'll pick one of the ways and then prove that it's equivalent to all the others. Um, the exponential function is defined in terms of limits, but not exactly the types of limits we've talked about already. You don't take limits through moving through real numbers, but just limits as you move through the natural numbers. So first we have to define what that means. It's a very small change in our definition of limit. Uh, we need to talk about the limit of a sequence. Um, after that, we'll have a sequence of polynomials that approaches the exponential function. So, um, so first of all, we need the notion of a sequence. And a sequence is just, well, it's a, it's a list of things. It's for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, or maybe you want to start at 4. For n equals 4, 5, 6, 7, and it keeps going. Maybe you want to start at negative 2, but then it goes n equals negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. So a sequence you, um, is, technically is, it's a function. whose domain, so I mean a real function, so it takes on values that are real numbers, but whose domain is a set of integers a set of integers greater than or equal to some fixed lower bound, so some smallest index smallest number. Um, and that's all it is. Um, but instead of writing f of k for the value of the function, we usually write f sub k for sequences. So an example, an example will clarify everything. Suppose we have a sequence. So for n greater than or equal to minus 2, we look at the sequence a sub n that, it, or that is, or how about k greater than or equal to minus 2? a sub k is 3 to the k. What does this mean? A sequence. It just means the k's are integers, all greater than or equal to minus 2. So it's just, you have a sub minus 2. Yes, that's the same as a of minus 2, but with sequences, it's standard to subscript by this, and we call it the index. So a sub minus 2 is 3 to the minus 2, so that would be a ninth. And then a minus 1 is 3 to the minus 1. That's a third. a sub 0 is 3 to the 0 is 1 over 1, so it's 1. Um, this is a sequence, and it's just... It's a function, but just where the independent variable is only allowed to be integers greater than or equal to some value. All right, that's a sequence. Then we have the limit of a sequence, but you only care about one kind of limit here. We talked about limits as x approaches b, but the index in a sequence, so the independent variable, is only getting, well, getting closer to one value, infinity. You just let the index get bigger and bigger. So we talk about the limit as n goes to infinity, or k, and it doesn't matter. The index is a dummy variable, but I'll try to stick with k. Uh, the limit as k goes to infinity of a k equals l. This means exactly what it meant when we wrote the limit as x goes to infinity of some function done to x equals l, except our independent variable is only allowed to vary among integers, but it, uh, I'll write the definition, but it just means as k gets really big, a sub k gets arbitrarily close to l. So technically it means for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists
some n greater than zero such that if k is greater than or equal to n, the absolute value of a k minus l is less than epsilon. Um, but k has to be an integer here, so integers, and that's the only difference. Uh, for sequences, it's standard to say that the sequence AK converges to L. So this is AK converges to L. If there is no L like this, we say that the sequence diverges, converges to L. All right. That's a sequence, and that's what it means for a sequence to converge to some number L. Um, before I can define the exponential, we need a particular integer function, so you can think of it as a sequence. We need factorials. You may have seen factorials before, but suppose n is an integer greater than, so a natural, well, an integer, but greater than or equal to zero. n factorial, so n factorial, you read this the way I just said it, read n factorial. By definition, it is the product of all of the numbers between n and 1, including n and 1. So it's n times the next lowest number, times n minus 1, times n minus 2. And you keep multiplying all those numbers together until you get down to times 2 times 1. That's n factorial. So for instance, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So it's, that would be 24, 24. That's factorials. I allowed n to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, what does it mean? This definition makes no sense when n is zero. We make a special definition when n is zero. We set zero factorial equal to one. That may look silly to, uh, why would you make it equal to one? And the reason we do that is because if you take one of the other factorials, like 4 factorial, it's 4 times, well, 3 times 2 times 1. But 3 times 2 times 1 is 3 factorial. So this is 4 times 3 factorial. And in general, for the same reason, n factorial is always just n times n minus 1 factorial. n factorial, it's n times n minus 1 factorial, and we'd like for this to be true even when n is 1, but when n is 1, this would say 1 factorial should be 1 times 0 factorial, but 1 factorial should, is 1, so we need for 0 factorial to be 1 for this formula to be true even when n is 1. So that's why we set um, 0 factorial equal to 1. All right. Those are the factorials. Now we're actually going to define not a sequence of real numbers, but a sequence of functions. So a bunch of functions indexed by the integers greater than or equal to zero. And then we're going to define the exponential function as a limit of those. So define. All right, let me give you the first few, and then I'll give you written out explicitly, and then I'll give you a, a general formula. P0 of x, <laughs> we define this to be the constant function, 1. P1 of x, P sub 1 of x, we define this to be 1 plus x. P sub 2 of x, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2. I'll write one more before I go to the general formula, p sub 3 of x. 1 plus x plus x squared over 2. But now I'm going to write 2 is 2 factorial. Yes, 2 factorial is just 2. It's 2 times 1. But I want you to see the pattern clearly. p sub 3 of x, you go out to x cubed over 3 factorial. So this is x cubed over 6, but it looks better if you write 3 factorial because that number matches that number. So. And in general, I want to define p sub n of x 
to be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial. And then you just keep taking powers of x divided by the same factorial. So you would go out to x to the n over n factorial. In summation notation, this sigma, this notation with the sigma, this is the sum as k goes from 0 to n of x to the k over k factorial. Whereas usual, by the function x to the 0, we mean the function that's 1, even when x is 0, even though 0 to the 0 is undefined. By x to the 0, we mean the function that's always 1. So we have this collection of polynomials. And every time we fix an x value, we get a sequence of numbers. So now think of x as being fixed. So fix x. So yes, it's a variable, but right now think of it as a fixed number. Then if you look at p, p sub k of x as k, when k is 0, 1, 2, and it just keeps going. So what does this mean? It means you, you fix this x, and you look at these polynomials evaluated at x. So this is some sequence of real numbers. It can be proved. We're not going to do it. But you can show that this limit always exists. The limit as k goes to infinity of this exists. So that this sequence, no matter what you pick for x, this sequence converges as k gets bigger this gets arbitrarily close to something, and it approaches some limit. That limit depends on the fixed x, so it's some function of x. So, yeah, you fix an x, you look at, you look at a limit of these things. Um, it always exists. That's not particularly easy to prove, but not particularly difficult either. We're not going to do it, though. Um, so you, you get a function of x by taking these limits. For each x, you look at this limit, it exists, that's some new function of x. You pick an x, you get a number, this limit. So that is the exponential function. The definition, the exponential function. So this exists for all x. The exponential function, exp. is the function whose domain is all of our is the, the entire set of real numbers whose domain is, let me write it as minus, the interval from minus infinity to infinity, such that x of x I want to keep these functions so such that x of x equals the limit that's nah, not going to fit there equals the limit as k goes to infinity of p sub k of x this is the exponential function what it means is that exp, you take the limit. Uh, I see I've switched indices. Yeah, maybe I'll call this n here, n here. So what it means is that exp of x is, I need two indices. I have a k here and an n there, so I want to use the same one twice. It's the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum as k goes from 0 to n of x to the k over k factorial. That's our definition of x. What nice properties does it have? It's, um, it's really kind of cool. Cool, once again, in that math dork sense of the word cool. Um, 
I need to take the derivatives of these. Let me write these again in a column where I can compare the derivatives easily. So here's p0 of x. It's 1. p1 of x. It's 1 plus x. p sub 2 of x. It's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2. p sub 3 of x. It's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2. I'll write the factorials plus x cubed over 3 factorial. And in general, p sub n of x is the sum as k goes from 0 to n of x to the k over k factorial. All right. What about the derivatives of these? So exp, the exponential function, is the limit of these. What about the derivatives? All right. p0 prime of x, well, that's 0. It's the derivative of 1. That's 0. These are all polynomials. We know how to take their derivatives. p1 prime of x. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of x is 1. So this is 1. p2 prime. You get a 0 plus a 1 plus the derivative of x squared by the power rule. You get 2 times x to the 1. That 2 cancels with this 2. You just get an x. p sub 3 prime. You get a 0 plus a 1 plus this 2 comes down this derivative again. It's still just x. Plus the derivative of x cubed, 3x squared. But then you can cancel that 3 with 3 factorial is 3 times 2 factorial. Right? 3 factorial is 3 times 2 factorial. So when you take the derivative of this and you get a 3x squared, that 3 cancels with that 3, and you're left with x squared over 2 factorial. I hope you see what's happening. This derivative is the same as p naught. This derivative, or this derivative, is the same as p1. This derivative is the same as p2. In other words, by taking the derivatives, we're getting exactly the same sequence, except we have this initial 0. And in particular, p, I mean, we can do the general case. In general, p sub n prime. Derivatives. Taking derivatives, it's a linear operation. We can split up sums, and that's just a constant. So the derivative of this summation divided by that constant, you just get the sum. You get a k x to the k minus 1 from the power rule divided by k factorial. Uh, we have to change our index a little bit because we started at when k is 0, the derivative of that term goes away. So we only need to, we want to start at k equals 1 here. Um, so you get this. But as we did here, when I differentiated this, I canceled a 3 with that 3. Yeah, you cancel a k with the k down here. Right? This k factorial is k times k minus 1 factorial. The k's cancel. And you get this. Now, it looks a little different, but it's just that the indexing has switched. In fact, it's exactly the same. When you plug in k equals 1, you get x to the 0 over 0 factorial. And when you plug in, right, let me rewrite this. But you get exactly what you see in the original sequence that we used to define x. The derivatives give you the same sequence, except it starts with a 0. So we get p sub n prime of x is the sum as k goes from 1 to n of x to the k minus 1 over k minus 1 factorial. This looks different, but if you start plugging in the k's, you see that it's the same. You plug in k equals 1, you get x to the 0 over 0 factorial 
plus what you get when k is 2 x to the 1 over 1 factorial plus what you get when k is 3 plus x squared over 2 factorial plus the last one you plug in k equals n you'd get x to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. So what we're getting is the derivative of p sub n of x was one of the things in our original sequence, but it appears one earlier in the sequence. What is the point of this? The point is that all right, we define the exponential function to be the limit of these p's evaluated at x. We see that the limit of the derivatives would be the same. It is not true always that because that you can find the derivative of the limit by taking the limit of the derivatives. Uh, you need a special kind of convergence called uniform convergence. I'll let you read about that in the book. But you can prove that this sequence of functions does converge uniformly on any bounded set. So for any particular x, we can pick a set that doesn't go out infinitely far and have these derivatives converge uniformly to the exponential function. So the derivatives converge to the exponential function just like the original set, just like the original pn's did. What this means is, the theorem is, the exponential function is differentiable everywhere and it is its own derivative. And the reason this is happening is because the polynomials that we take the limit of to get the exponential function, when you take their derivatives, you just get the sequence of polynomials back and they converge very nicely. Um, so the exponential function is very strange. It's its own derivative. Um, and also there's one other thing we'd like to know and that's the value at x bit 0. When, x, when you plug in x equals 0, all of these polynomials are 1. Right? When x is 0, this is 1. This is 1. These terms are 0, so this is 1. When you plug in x is 0, all of these polynomials are 0, so of course their limit, uh, sorry, when you plug in x is 0, all of these polynomials are 1, so of course the limit is 1. So this is the big theorem. The exponential function is a function defined for all real numbers. It is its own derivative, and its value at 0 is 1. In fact, these two properties characterize the exponential function. We'll see that in a minute. But the exponential function is the only function defined on the entire set of real numbers that has these two properties. So we could have defined it that way. I could have said, I, I didn't prove for you that the limit of the sequence exists, the limit of the pn's exists. I might as well have just said, oh, let's assume there's one function that makes this true. And um, you know, not prove that for you equally as well. But there are advantages to using what we used as the definition, and we'll get to those soon. <coughs> so, okay, the exponential function is its own derivative, and of course you can combine that with our other differentiation rules like the product rule, the chain rule, the, the quotient rule, any of those. So for instance, it's easy to take what's the derivative of x times the exponential function of 5x. This is the product of two functions. It's x and the exponential function done to 5x. So you use the product rule. It is the first thing times the derivative of the second. Plus the second thing, the x plus 5x, times the derivative of the first thing. So that's the derivative of just x. The derivative of this part, well, you use the chain rule because here's one function done to x and here's another function done to that. So you differentiate the outside function, leaving the inside stuff exactly how it was. But then you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside function. So times the derivative of 5x. Plus, you get the x plus 5x. The derivative of x is just 1. 
and then you figure out what these are. X prime is just X. It's its own derivative. So you just get X of 5X. And then the derivative of 5X is just 5. And you get plus an X of 5X. Um, you can make this look a little neater. There's an X of 5X here and an X of 5X here. You can factor that out. You'd be left with a 5X plus 1. So you can write this as 5X plus 1 times x of 5x. All right. OK. Um, I'd like to see that the exponential function is always positive. And in fact, it's kind of weird, but it follows from this, that the exponential function is always positive. It shouldn't be clear why that's true, but it's kind of a cool trick. So theorem, the theorem is that x of x times x of negative x is always equal to 1. This is for all x. In particular, x of x is never 0 because then the product wouldn't be 1, couldn't be 1. x of x is unequal to 0. And in fact, um, and in fact, x of x is always positive. All right. There'll be a lot of proofs that we skip, but this isn't one of them. It's easy. It's kind of cool. and. Um, it's how you prove a lot of things about the exponential function. So we're, we're going to look at the derivative of this product. We're going to look at the derivative of this function and see that it's 0. And once its derivative is 0, we know that that implies that the original function was constant. We're trying to show it's 1. First, we're going to show it's constant. Then we're going to show that the constant has to be 1. So how do you show it's constant? You show that this derivative is 0. So you calculate it. This is the product of two functions. And then here, this is the composition of negating x and taking the exponential function. So we use the product rule and the chain rule. You get the first thing times the derivative of the second. This is the product rule. The first thing times the derivative of the second, plus the second thing, the x of minus x, times the derivative of the first. That was the product rule. Now we still have to calculate this, but the derivative of x is x. And we have to calculate this derivative, but that's the chain rule. So here we get x of x. The derivative of this, you differentiate the outside function, x. The derivative of x is just x. And you leave the inside stuff the way it was. So still sitting there, happily being negative x. But then you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside function. And the derivative of minus x is minus 1. Plus, and then you get x of minus x times, and then this is just x of x. But if you look at this, this is 0, because here we have negative x of x times x of minus x. And here we have positive x of x times x of minus x. So this is 0. Great. So now we know that this product is always a constant. We're not sure what the constant is, or maybe you are if you're looking ahead. But we know it's a constant. Now we need to show the constant's 1. How do you show the constant's 1? Ah, we, we saw that x at 0 is 1. So when you put in x is 0, you get this is 1. This is also x at 0. So this, this equality has to be true when x is anything, but in particular when x is 0. But when x is 0, this is 1. This is 1. So c has to be 1 times 1. Wait, I'll do it in my head. Uh, 1. c is 1. So you get this. Great. So yeah, that means x of x is never 0. 
All right, why does that imply x of x is positive? Well, it's never zero, and x of x is differentiable because its derivative every place is x of x. In particular, it exists. So the function is differentiable, so it's continuous. It's continuous, and it's never zero. That means, by the intermediate value theorem, that either it's always positive or it's always negative. So x of x it either must always be positive or always be negative because it never hits zero and it's continuous. But we know that when x is zero, it's one and one is positive. So x of x must always be positive. All right. So x of x is its own derivative and that derivative is always positive because its derivative is itself, and we just showed that was always greater than zero. Well, that means all the derivatives of x are x, right? You can keep differentiating, like what's the second derivative of the exponential function? Well, it's the derivative of the derivative. But, so, but the derivative of this is the derivative of this, but the derivative of this is just x again. All the derivatives of x, and remember we write the higher derivatives, you can write an n in parentheses here. So the nth derivative of x, it's still just x. And they're all greater than 0. In particular, since the first derivative is greater than 0, this says x is always increasing, is a strictly increasing function. This, the second derivative being positive, remember this tells you that the graph of f, or the graph of x, is always concave up. Let me cheat slightly and go ahead and sketch the graph of the exponential function before we really know all that we have to to know that the graph looks like what I'm about to write. Um, it's increasing. It's always concave up. Its value at 0 is 1. It's always positive. It's defined for all real numbers. So what does the graph of x look like? It looks like this. Um, it looks like this. Um, it's con the graph is always concave up. It's increasing, strictly increasing, which means the graph heads roughly from the lower left to the upper right. It's defined for all x. It gets big very fast. We don't really know that yet. We don't, we know it's always positive, so the y coordinate's always positive. What we don't really know is that it approaches the x axis as x approaches negative infinity, and that the y value goes to infinity, gets very big, very fast as x gets big. I mean, we know because the function's increasing that as x gets big, y gets big, but this makes it look like it does it very rapidly, um, and that it heads off to infinity. All right. Why are those things true? It'll take a minute for us to get there. We need some algebraic properties of x, so let me give you those. So theorem, um, let, or suppose, a is a real number. So anything, any real number, and r is a rational number, so a fraction. Then x of a plus x equals x of a 
times x of x. And x of rx equals x of x to the r. I want those things may not be easy to remember, so let me kind of go ahead in the section and say something now that'll make those easier to remember. It's I do want to say something about how you prove those without doing it, but assuming you believe those, or believe those are true for a minute, we've got this. And what this means is, suppose we define a number e, define e to equal x of 1. So the value of the exponential function when x is 1, call it something. We're going to call it e. Then what does this thing tell you? You can pick x to be 1, and this thing says that x of r, if x is 1, this thing says x of r equals x of 1 to the, raised to the r power. But we gave x of 1 a name. We called it e. So when x is 1, this would be e to the r. It means that the exponential function done to any rational number r is e raised to the r power. The exponential function is continuous. If you already know that raising functions to powers is a continuous function of the power, this would tell you, in fact, that x of x, the exponential function, is exactly raising e to the x power. Why am I not stating this as a theorem? Well, it depends. If you already know that a, what it means to raise a positive base to a real number that's not rational, so raise a positive base to an irrational, then this is a theorem. And, and you know that that's a continuous operation. This is a theorem. The kind of sneaky way around the problems in defining raising things to irrational powers is to use this as the definition for what e to the x means. And that is what we do in the book. We actually define e to the x to mean the exponential function, um, which you, it's a theorem that that agrees with e to the r for rational r. And for irrational powers, we use the exponential function as the definition of e to an irrational power. But I'll say it again, if you're comfortable with raising positive numbers to irrational powers, and you believe that's a continuous operation, then this is true as a theorem for you. So if you, with that definition, what do these two algebraic properties say? The first one says, both of these should be very familiar to you. It says e to the a plus x equals e to the a times e to the x. And this bottom one says that e to the rx, e to the rx, is e to the x raised to the r power. Algebraically, you should know these are true. That when you multiply something to, to base, with base e to something else to base e, the exponents just add. And when you raise an exponent, when you raise something to an exponent, raise that to an exponent, the exponents multiply. So that's what these two properties say. Um, why, how do you prove them without knowing them ahead of time, right? If I'm using this as my definition of what e to the x is, I can't say, oh, it's true for e to the x, so it's true for this. I have to prove it's true for this. First, you prove these the same way we proved that, essentially the same way we proved that e to the x of x times x of negative x is 1. You take the derivative of something and show that it's a constant, and then you show the constant is 1. What derivatives do you take? Or what functions do you take derivatives of? Well, for instance, this one, you take e to the a plus x and divide by, I'm oh, sorry, x of a plus x and divide by x of a times x of x. So I'm not going to do this. It is easy, but if you take, it just takes time. If you take this quotient, And take, and 
take its derivative, um, then using the rules that you know, you'll be able to show its derivative is zero. Once its derivative is zero, that quotient is a constant. How do you figure out what the constant is? You plug in x equals zero, and here you'll get one, and here you'll, so then you'll end up with x of a over x of a. That's one. So yeah, the constant has to be one, so these have to be equal. It's the same thing you do here. You take this divided by that, and then you take the derivative, and you show that you get zero, so it's a constant. Once again, you plug in x equals zero and see that the constant's one. All right. Um, I would like to prove, so, well, there are a bunch of things I'd like to prove, but right now let me at least show that as x goes to negative infinity, the value of the exponential function is zero, or heads to zero, so approaches zero. And as x goes to positive infinity, the exponential function goes to positive infinity. This is actually very easy for us now, given where things are for us. We've, we know that I'm now going to write x of x is e to the x. So we know e to the 0 is 1. We know the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. Right? This is the exponential function. It's its own derivative. Do not confuse this. This is a horrible mistake that people make all the time. Um, do not confuse this with the power rule. The derivative of this is absolutely unequal to you bring the exponent down and subtract 1 from the exponent. Why? Why is it different? Because the power rule is where you use that for where the base is a variable and the exponent is fixed. Right? That's not the same as the exponential function. The exponential function, the base is fixed and the exponent's variable. This is the base is variable and the exponent's fixed. They look similar, but they're very different functions. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. If it helps you, just write x of x. You wouldn't be tempted to do that. Um, but what do we know? e is our definition of what x of x meant was a limit of a sequence. And so what is e for us? Well, e was x of 1. And if you look at the polynomials defining that we use to define x, that means that e is this. This is what E is. <coughs> you evaluate this sum for different n's, and you take the limit as n approaches infinity, so as n gets big. We can make this. You know, we said that the limit exists. I didn't prove it for you, but part of what that means is if you say how close you want to be to E, you can pick n large enough so that this sum is that close. But, you know, but we don't have an effective way of doing that. I didn't give you an algorithm. If someone actually hands you an epsilon telling you how close you want to be to E, I can't, well, right now, I can't tell you how big you'd have to pick in. In fact, that is done in this section of the book. I'm not going to do it because it takes us into kind of partial, it takes us into some finite geometric sums. It's a little farther than I want to go right now. But one thing that's certainly true, as n gets bigger, this sum gets bigger, right? because you're adding more positive terms, so that at the very least, we know e is bigger than 1 plus 1. e is bigger than 2. In fact, it's bigger than 2 and a half, and it's bigger than 2 and a half plus a sixth. Um, certainly e, at the very least, e is greater than 2. You can show without too much difficulty, and I'll say it again, it is in the book, E is less than 3. Um, certainly E is between 2 and 3. I'll say less than or equal to 3 because when you actually work this out, that's what you get. Then you can work it out. You can get a better approximation. You can go out more terms this way and get a better upper bound. In fact, I'm sure that all of you have calculators and you have an E to the X button. If you put in X equals 1, your calculator will give you, I don't have this memorized, that E is approximately 
2.718281828246, something like that. So that's the approximate value of E. It's between 2 and 3. Um, what's so important about that? Well, we know that x of x is e to the x, or so e to the x. What happens as x goes to minus infinity? Well, e is bigger than 2. And so, actually, let me do as x goes to infinity first. e is bigger than 2. As you raise a number bigger than 2 to larger and larger powers, you get a very large number very quickly. And if you take 2 and keep raising it to powers, it gets very big pretty fast. So that's why as x goes to infinity, so what you're seeing in the graph, as x goes to infinity, e to the x goes to infinity, and it does it really fast. So the limit as n goes to infinity, but then this is a, a strictly increasing function. So it's true that the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x is infinity. But we know that um, limit as x approaches negative infinity of e to the x. Well, that would be the limit as, let me call it a different variable name. Oh, maybe not y. Well, as t goes to infinity of e to the negative t, right? I've now said t goes to infinity, but put a negative t here. So it's still the same limit. The limit as whatever the exponent is, is going to minus infinity. But I wrote this because e to the minus t is 1 over e to the t. So this is the limit as t goes to infinity of 1 over e to the t. But we just said that as x goes to infinity, e to the x goes to infinity. What's well, the same thing as t goes to infinity, e to the t goes to infinity. So as t gets really big, e to the t gets really big. 1 over that gets very close to 0. And in the limit, the limit is 0. And that's why you see that the limit as x approaches minus infinity is 0, because it's 1 over what happens as x goes to infinity. So yes, the graph v to the x looks like this. All right. Um, I guess I'd like to prove one more thing, and that's that the exponential function is the only function that's its own derivative and um, equals 1 when x is 0, and then talk about exponential growth and decay as a good example of why you might care about exponential functions. So, a theorem suppose f is defined on an open interval. And k is a constant such that f prime of x equals k times f of x for all x and i. So I'm assuming f is defined on an open interval. Maybe its domain is even bigger, but it's at least defined on an open interval. And by writing this, I'm assuming it's differentiable at each point in the open interval, and that its derivative at each point in that open interval is a constant times the function itself. So for instance, the exponential function is like this, where the interval would be the entire real line, and k would be 1, so that f prime of x is f of x. But we're allowing an extra constant k here. Then there exists a constant c. Such that f of x equals c e to the kt 
uh, kx for all x and i. So f of x doesn't have to be the exponential function. In fact, if k is not 1, it couldn't be. But it has to be the exponential function done to not just x, but a constant times x, and then multiplied by a constant. How do you show this? Well, again, it's, it's how we showed that e to the x times e to the minus x was a constant, and then that the constant's 1. It's how I said you would show these two algebraic properties that I didn't show. It's because I also knew that I'd be doing this here. So the proof, it's kind of the same proof, kind of the same. The idea is the same. Proof, we're going to show some derivative is 0, which means that what we're taking derivative of is a constant. And then we're going to show that that constant, well, <laughs> then actually that constant is going to be c. We're not going to show that it's 1. We're going to just call it c. So um, consider. Uh, just take f of x and divide by e to the kx. I want to look at that function and take its derivative. Notice that this function is differentiable on i. f was differentiable on i. This is differentiable everywhere, and e raised to something is never 0. So that this is a differentiable function on i. And so we take its the derivative of this quotient. And we'll use the quotient rule. It is the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. But by assumption, the derivative of f prime is k times f. So we get e to the kx. This is k times f of x minus f of x times, bad board organization, minus f of x times the derivative of this. Keep in mind, this is x of kx. It's the same thing. We're about to do the chain rule to it. It looks a little weird when it's written as e to something because it's unclear what's the inside function, what's the outside function. The outside function is x, so it's the raising to the e. The inside function is k times x. So the derivative of this, you take the derivative of the outside function, leaving the inside stuff the way it was. But the derivative of x is x. So that just gives you back the e to the kx. But then by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside function. So times the derivative of kx, so you pick up a times k. And this is all divided by something that's not 0. But here we have e to the kx times k times f of x. Here's e to the kx times k times f of x. This is 0. So the derivative of this function is 0, which means it's a constant. But that's what this says. That's exactly what this says, that f of x divided by e to the kx is a constant. And so that's how you show this. What's nice about that is it tells us quickly that when k is 1, so for the exponential function, um, for the exponential function, so one of the things that's nice about it is that for the exponential function, when k is 1, we find that if f prime of x equals f of x, what this theorem says is then f of x is some constant times just e to the x. So then if you knew that f of 0, so if this is true and f at 0 is 1, then you would know, oh, and 1 equals f of 0 equals c times e to the 0 which means c is 1, which means f of x is e to the x. <laughs> what is the point of this? The point is there's only one function defined on the entire set of real numbers 
that's its own derivative and whose value at zero is one, and that's e to the x, because what this theorem says is that if you take any function with those properties, or with the right derivative property, you get back a constant times e to the x, and if you also require that f of zero equals one, the constant has to be one. So, yeah, e to the x is completely characterized by the fact that it's its own derivative and its value at zero is one. All right, I'd like to, uh, this is the last thing I do in this section, I'd like to talk about this result right here that, or that I've now messed up, that if f prime of x equals k times f of x, then f of x is of this form. Um, in, in the real world, a lot of things change that, at that, in that way, where x is time. So, so this is an example what I'm about to do is um, exponential growth and decay. So suppose you have some quantity of something that's changing with time. So suppose A equals A of T is the quantity of something. What kind of something is the quantity of something as a function? time t. For instance, A of t might be the population somewhere of a city or a country. A population um, as a function of time. Or it might be a quantity of radioactive material measured in either atoms or weight or mass. What happens in many, or in a number of interesting cases, is that the rate of change of the quantity is proportional to the quantity present. So suppose the rate of change of A, I mean with respect to time, is proportional to is proportional to A. So for instance, if A is a population, why might the rate of change of the population be proportional to the population? Well, it's because if you have twice as many people, you might have twice as many people dying in the same amount of time and twice as many people being born in, in the same amount of time. Or if you had three times as many people, three times as many deaths, and three times as many births. And you, you kind of expect that the rate of change of the population will roughly be proportional to the population. That you know, as, as the population is multiplied by some amount, the rate of change of the population would be more or less multiplied by the same amount. For radioactive decay, so you have a radioactive substance, the the radioactive substance decays and changes into other things that we're not calling part of the quantity anymore. Um, and when you've got twice as much uranium, then it decays at twice the rate. It decays twice as fast, and so you lose. It's like you know, uranium's dying. I guess in a way it's like the population problem, if you think of the uranium as the population. The uranium's dying. If you have twice as much, it dies at twice the rate. Um, you lose twice as much uranium um, in a given amount of time if you've got twice as much, or three times as much if you've got three times as much. Why is this called exponential growth and decay? Well, it means that the rate of change of A with respect to T is just like this differential equation. It means we are saying dA dt is proportional to, is proportional to me, means equals a constant times, 
So the rate of change of the amount is proportional to the amount. It means you've got this. But according to the theorem that I just erased the bottom part of, this implies, this implies that A is some constant times e to the kt. So that A can be written as a constant times the exponential function applied to a constant times t. So that's why this is called exponential growth and decay. It is of this form that uses the exponential function. Um, there are a couple more things I want to say about this. One is that, okay, this is an arbitrary constant c, and no matter what we pick for c here, this would be true. But c actually has physical meaning, and you can get physical meaning for c by, by plugging in t equals 0. When t equals 0, uh, I'm assuming that A is defined at time zero, that time zero for us means some time at which we started talking about the problem, so in particular, um, everything's defined and the differential equation is true, this relation is, or this relation is true at time zero. Um, when t equals zero, you would get, well, A, this, you'd get the amount at time zero equals C times e to the k times 0, that's e to the 0, e to the 0 is 1, that's c. So what is the constant c? Oh, it's a at time 0. But a at time 0, this is usually called the initial amount, or the initial value of a. And um, one way, instead of writing a of 0, it's common to write this as a sub 0, or call it a naught. Um, so that, in general, if you have something that's exhibiting exponential growth or decay, so something whose rate of change is proportional to the amount present, what you get is that A, the amount, is always equal to the initial amount times e to the kt. Um, the last thing I want to say about this. is that if k is positive, then d, and assuming a is really an amount of something so that it's positive, so assuming a of t is a positive function, so it's measuring some quantity of something, and k is positive, then that would mean dA dt is positive. And so um, that would mean a is increasing, and that's when we say you have exponential growth. So ex assuming a is positive, then exponential growth is when k is positive. So exponential growth, so assuming a is greater than 0, exponential growth is when k is positive. Exponential decay is when k is negative. So for instance, for radioactive material, the k would always be negative. For population, for the rate of change of a population, it depends. If the birth rate is greater than the death rate, then the population would be going up and this k would be positive. If the death rate is higher than the birth rate, then your population is decreasing and the k would be negative. The convention is, there is a convention here and it's it's not always followed, but if you ever wonder why I, or the book, is R inserting some explicit minus signs, the convention is that if you can pick your proportionality constants appropriately early, you pick them to be positive and, and insert explicit minus signs if you want something to be negative. So what I'm saying is, for exponential decay, instead of saying dA dt, dA dt equals ka and k is negative, you would typically, it, it doesn't matter really, but it's just convention, that you would write dA dt is negative ka and this k is positive. So that negative k is negative, and so this negative k is playing the role of k there. It's just a convention that if you can do so, you insert these explicit minus signs 
and make your proportionality constants positive just because people look at that and want to be able to just kind of know without reading that, oh, yeah, the rate of change of this is negative, or at least suspect it, and, and then, you know, check, make sure later that k is a positive number. All right, that's the exponential function. In the next section, we'll do the inverse of the exponential function, which is the natural logarithm function, which is a logarithm because it'll be the inverse of raising e to powers, which is log base e, assuming you already know what logarithms are.